Hi, Mark. So you are Hello, in Dr. Atlanta. Ryan. So you are in Atlanta and I'm here in Bombay. I'm in Atlanta today. Uh, it's a little rainy here, not like Scottsdale, Arizona, where I live, but uh, uh, I'm in Atlanta just for a day or two and then I come home tomorrow night. Great. So uh, today we are starting our first episode and the first episode which I'm having with you is called Flatlined. This is based on your book, Flatlined, which is why lean transformation fails and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. To introduce myself, my name is Dr. Mohan Parmeshwaran and thanks to Mark, who uh, changed my name uh, and I'm happy he did that and he called me Dr. M. Thank you very much, Mark. And now I'm known in, on LinkedIn as Dr. M. You are, you're famous. And you know what? Uh, I want royalties from your name. Sure, uh, royalties, I'll give it to you virtually. You have to, no, you have to buy me dinner when I come to India, so, okay. Absolutely, <laughs> I, I would do that. <laughs> Mark, uh, I know him as Mark, and uh, forgive me if I pronounce your surname uh, right, Deluzio, am I right? Perfect, you almost sound Perfect. like you're Italian, that's good. In any case, Lean never said that we have to be perfect towards perfectness, sure. So we did it right, so Mark Deluzio, he is the, everybody knows you, so I don't know why I'm introducing you, but I will introduce you, <laughs> right? So uh, he is a lean pioneer and he's globally recognized. And what he's recognized for is the Denver business systems that he introduced. He's an architect for that. He's a pioneer in that area. And what he's more famously known for, and I'm going to capitalize on him, is that he's the first, first person uh, who introduced the concept of lean accounting processes in USA for Denher Jake Break Division. Am I right, Mark? Yes. That's correct. And uh, he has been a director on the board for Helen Brand. And now, He's a proud founder and the CEO of, you can see him there, Lean Horizons Consultants, like Global Consultants. And one day I was asking him, what does the horizons mean? The horizon according to, would you like to take the call, Mark? Because horizon, yeah, I think you when, I, it. Well, when I named it. When I named, if you look at the symbol, you know, I don't tell too many people, but uh, the, it's the rising sun, uh, which is um, paying tribute to my Japanese senseis, Mr. Iwata and Mr. Nakao and, and many others, but those two primary ones uh, from Shigejutsu, who were taught directly by Tashi Ono. My first trip to Japan was in 1990, and unfortunately, Ono's son died that same year, so I never got to meet Ono, but uh, I, I did meet him through uh, virtually, if you will, through uh, my senseis. So that's what that rising sun is. And then, of course, the mountain is supposed to represent Mount Fuji, which is a beautiful uh, mountain. But I when I only put one mountain there, it didn't look right. So I added a second mountain peak. Uh, so that's kind of uh, a little cheating there. But, uh, but anyway, the whole idea of a horizon is that, you know, lean is a journey, right? And when you reach if you're looking out at the horizon and you start journeying towards that horizon, once you reach that point, what do you see? Another horizon, okay? And it continues, right? And it, can, it will never stop. So that's the whole idea of a horizon is that once I reach that point out in the horizon, I, all I see is another horizon. And, and it's a continuous journey. And that's really what Lean's all about. You never arrive, you're always learning. Uh, what you think you know today, may you may discount in five years. And uh, it's always, uh, how do we learn? How do we grow, right? Not only in business, but in our personal life too, so. That's true. Uh, some of the things that uh, my sensei, uh, Masaki Imai, has told me is this, that 
the standard of today is not the standard of tomorrow, but that also continually improves. And that is how he's uh, defined this of Kaizen, of saying is change for better. Wherever you are today, you become better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Standardize that and then you become better tomorrow. And this goes on and goes on. That's precisely what you're talking about, the concept of horizon. Thanks yeah, a lot. You know, for and, I, and I also, at, at dinner, I came up with this saying, it's, it's called, because, uh, you know, what you don't want to do is continue to beat yourself up and say, oh, I'm not good enough, right? So I had a phrase that I came up with. It was uh, a healthy dissatisfaction with the status quo. Healthy. The key word is healthy, okay? That, you know, on Friday afternoon, we're going to celebrate all the great things we did that week. And we come back on Monday, we'll have a new attitude towards getting even better, right? Maybe we take the weekend off. <laughs> but, uh, but that's how our, we think about it. It's a, it's a healthy approach to improvement. Matter of fact, we almost welcome problems so that we can improve. And that's a different attitude of, of, of looking at a problem as a welcoming. I remember going to one of the uh, Hitachi in Japan, one of my study missions. They thought that warranty returns were such a treasure chest to them because warranty was like, they saw that as a, they couldn't wait to get into their warranty. Most companies put warranty aside, don't even look at it for a year, you know? But they looked at it like, I can't wait to get into that warranty so we can find out how to get better, right? And that's, that's their attitude. So it's all based on how you think about it. So that's the real key. Yeah, there's another book that you wrote, uh, which, was, uh, which is called The uh, Turn Waste into Wealth. Mm -hmm. That was before Flatlined. And... Uh, that was the title itself was quite, is a basic. I have not read much about it, and I think I would uh, read much more about it. And that is the fundamentals, I think, of what uh, Toyota production system is all about: how do you convert waste into wealth. I'll have to, I should have sent you that book too when I sent you my other book, and I'll, I'll get it out to you. Um, you. You know, that book really was more about forty or fifty little chapters of just little anecdotes, if you will, and stories. And it, it was designed for somebody maybe who doesn't know a lot about lean and so they could read about it and get a feel for what it's all about. You know, it wasn't really a textbook or anything like that, but uh, you know, uh, that's really what that was about. And uh, so uh, the whole idea is that if you can improve your safety quality and your on-time delivery and your lead times, you'll grow your business. You can even take a commodity business and actually drive value, uh, you know, you, you can grow the business and believe it or not, even charge more for a commodity if you're the best in quality or if you're the best in service. So a lot of people don't think that, everybody thinks they have to have, you know, some super duper technology to sell. And uh, if you can compete very effectively through quality and, 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 uh, and service and lead time, uh, and then, you know, nobody can touch you. You know, uh, as long as you don't stand still, you have to keep improving. So, Mark, uh, when I was uh, talking to you earlier, uh, and when you introduced me to your book called, uh, which we are going to talk about, Flat Flatlined, that is what brought me into this series which I'm running on Lean, on Toyota Production System. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding and there is a lot of understanding that is missed. And therefore, I said, I'm not going to include implementing of Lean. So that series that I've started, and you are my first guest, and thank you very much for being my first guest, well, is thank you. on supporting and sustaining continuous improvement processes. That's the basic theme that I'm going to run the entire series on, and you are my first guest on my first episode, and I'm handing it over to you, and we will be talking today on this episode, mm -hmm. uh, which is titled, based on your book, Flatlined. After okay. that, yeah, after that, we have another episode that you would be hosting. Rather, I will be hosting, you're going to be the guest, and that will be 
Toyota production system overview. The third episode that I will have with you is 10 rules for a process. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is going to be on strategy deployment. And the fifth one on lean accounting. Yes. Later, we take it forward and see what we are going to do further. I'm sorry, my, my phantom, my Labrador said it's time for you to host the show. So I'm handing it over to you. Here we go. It sounds like he wants to get going on the presentation. That's what he sounds like. So, okay. So if you so, send it over to me. I am going to hand it over to you, Mark. Here we go. Okay. Let me, uh, very good. Just give me a minute while I share my screen and I'm gonna put up my presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. M. Um, really good to be here. Um, and let's see, maybe I'll move my little picture up to the corner here. Um, thanks, Dr. M, this is fun. Uh, I like, doing this with you and I look forward to hope, hope people can uh, get something out of this. Uh, so let me talk about the book, uh, Flatline. Why did I call it that, right? I called it that because over the years, uh, so I've, I've had Lean Horizons as uh, for 20 years now. And I don't know, people have gotten into Lean and uh, over the years, I've seen so many different transformations. And I started noticing the same failure points, if you will, almost like you can almost predict what's going to, everybody says, you know, lean is so, lean is so uh, uh, common sense, right? And uh, it's really counterintuitive, believe it or not. There's a lot of things in lean that don't make a lot of sense when you really think about it. And it's hard sometimes to overcome existing paradigms about how we think. So why did I call it flatline? That's the word that almost every CEO who calls me say, Mark, we've been doing lean for 10 years and we've flatlined. So I thought it was a good name for a book. And I said, well, geez, you know, I noticed four or five key things that all these companies had in common. And it didn't matter which industry, it didn't matter aerospace, pharmaceutical, insurance, uh, you know, all kinds of different in industries. And they all have very similar characteristics as to why, if you will, their transformations weren't what they wanted them to be. I call it failing. I'm not saying they totally failed, but you know they didn't really realize what they really uh, could have realized had they thought about this differently. So that's what this uh, presentation is all about. And of course, I'm going to also tell, it's easy to point out the issues like a lot of people do, but then I'm going to talk about what to do about it as well, okay? And, and how you have to do different things to be able to get back on track. So let's uh, let's go into the presentation. Um, you know, when when people look at the Dan and her business system, you know they they see this nice, beautiful, shiny, sunlit iceberg, and that's all the great profits and the great accolades with DBS and all that. But there was a lot of turmoil developing the Dan and her business system. Uh, and, you know, as you know, the, the, the bottom of the iceberg is what sunk the Titanic, okay? But that's the part you don't see. We had a lot of setbacks. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. As a matter of fact, I have a whole other presentation called Humble Errors. And uh, part of that presentation talks a little bit about, uh, is, is incorporated into this presentation, but, but I call humble errors, the 10 errors I made in creating the Dan, her business system. What would I have done differently, right? And I think sometimes you learn more from the errors than talking about your successes, right? So, so this iceberg, when you see greatness, if you see somebody, let's say, who's really successful, whether it's an athlete, a business executive, it doesn't matter, a doctor, it's not all beauty. They put a lot of pain and suffering, and, and the real key is, how do you rebound from the errors and the mistakes that you, everybody's gonna make, right? So this book is all about trying to warn you about some of the key things that I've seen people make all the way through, and maybe we can start thinking about avoiding them, okay? I remember my first visit to Toyota, Dr. M, and, uh, and uh, they told me, 
the difference between a world-class company and a not so world-class company is their ability to solve problems. And uh, the more I get into this, the more I say, this is all about solving problems, right? Uh, that's what Lean is all about. And they said, even the great Toyota, you know, has problems every day, but we only solve our problems once, okay? They really solve them, all right? And that's the difference between a great company and a not so. So how do you, how, when you have all the bottom part, the turbulent part of the iceberg, how do you, even as an individual, rebound? Do you let it consume you? Or do you get back up in the morning and say, no, I'm gonna go back and, and do better today, right? So that's the whole idea behind this, okay? And you have to have that tenacity and discipline. We'll talk about discipline uh, to, to make sure this is all gonna work. So, you know, basically my career started back actually in 1987 uh, with Jake Break. And I worked there as a financial executive and I became the chief uh, financial officer working for uh, George Konensaker and Art Byrne. You may know those names. They're pretty big names in the lean uh, industry. Art Byrne actually wrote the foreword to my book, uh, Flatlined. And uh, I, I did create the, you know, the lean accounting. Uh, and then I went into operations. I became general manager of the Asian business when I was fortunate enough to have Hino Motors as my customer. And I was asked in 1992 by George Sherman, our new CEO, who God rest his soul just passed away, uh, a great mentor to me and, and so many others, Larry Culp, who's now working uh, as CEO of GE. Um, uh, we all you know, learned and, and were mentored by George and was probably the most fantastic CEO I've ever met in my life. Um, uh, he asked me, he said, do for Danaher what you guys did for Jake Break, because we turned Jake Break around. And I won't get into the Jake Break story all that much right now, but uh, that gave birth, if you will, to what we now call the Danaher business system, okay? Uh, so, so as you go through this timeline and you know, my career is a heck of a lot more that went out of my career than just what's on here, but uh, I, I got inducted to the Shingo uh, Academy, uh, the Hall of Fame, if you will, for Lean, and uh, you know, had, had Lean Horizon started in 2001, and 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 this is where I started getting calls in 2010. Hey, we, we're flatlined, right? So I'm going to talk about all these different things, and as you can see, some of the results of what, and this this chart only goes through 2016, right before the Ford have split off from Danaher. I probably need to update this chart, but. You can see how Jake, uh, how Danaher did in comparison with uh, all their peer companies, right? And uh, quite frankly, uh, the Danaher business system was given an awful lot of credit for this type of performance. Uh, but it wasn't just the Danaher business system, it was great leadership as well. You need both and great people. So, what, let's talk about why they flatlined. Why, what, all these companies that I've seen over the years, uh, and they've all hit the same similar roads that we all hit at Danaher. How do we look at this? Well, well, a lot of times people looking at lean as a very short-term tactical tool. And by the way, they're looking at it as a tool, not a culture change, okay? Uh, lean initiatives not connected to the strategy. I'm gonna talk more about that. When we talk about policy deployment or you know what I call strategy deployment. Optimizing functions, okay, is key, but you've got to op optimize the enterprise, okay? If you just optimize a function, you're not gonna win. You've got to think about optimizing the enterprise. So when we set out with the Danaher business system, we did not want to become the best manufacturing company in the world. We wanted to become the best enterprise in the world. All right, there's a big difference. Leadership treats lean as a spectator sport. They don't get involved. And probably the best CEO I know of getting involved was Art Byrne, who, who you know, I remember people would come home and, hey, you're not going to believe that the CEO taught me standard work today. And he was down in his jeans teaching me um, how to do one piece flow or 5S or whatever, right? CEOs like to, delegate this and that doesn't work. So we need a shift in mindset 
And, you know, Dr. M talks about sustainable results. We need to default to the basics. Talk about that in a minute. We have to align our efforts with our strategic plan. We have to make it an enterprise-wide endeavor, not just manufacturing, not just operations, not just engineering. And we have to evolve our culture as an organization. So let's talk about this. Step one, shift the lean mindset, okay? This was said to me on my first trip to Japan in 1990. And I've been to Japan now probably 30 times. I've been you know, half a dozen, maybe more study missions over there. And um, I asked the senior executive at Toyota how he could allow all his competition, you know, Ford, GM, Chrysler, to come in and see their plant. And this is what he responded. He said, what they need to know, they cannot see, okay? And, 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 and I didn't really know what he meant. Maybe I still don't, but I got a sense over the years, this is always in the back of my mind, you know, what, what did he really mean, you know? I think he meant the invisible stuff, the respect for people, the culture, you know, anybody could put up a red end down light to show that the machine is down. Well, what's the standard work and the sense of urgency and the processes behind getting that machine back up again? Anybody, like I said, could put that light up, big deal, right? Anybody could put a gimbal board up. I see so many gimbal boards today. It seems like that's the, uh, the tool du jour of, of lean. Everybody wants to put Gemba boards up to, you know, the virtual signal that they're doing lean, but nobody how, knows how to problem solve off the data that comes off those boards. And half the data is not even meaningful. So, you know, what they need to know, they cannot see. How does it all tie into the culture and the thinking of the organization? How do we solve pro problems at the lowest level in the organization? Okay, so we have to shift the mindset as we as we go through okay so one of the things i came up with was this thing called the lean trilogy i have a, actually it's in my book and i actually have a white paper on it and if you only think about the shareholder or the owner or profits if you will and don't think about the customer or the employee as the means to get you that result all three of these groups have to win and you could probably add a couple more stakeholders here okay you could look at suppliers you can look at society the environment but i picked these three in particular to say that there's got to be a win-win proposition here everybody has to win if your employees lose at the expense of your shareholders for their gain it's not going to be sustainable okay now a lot of people think they know what the customer wants. They know what their employees want. Mm, I'm going to guess you don't. Okay. And, and I, and actually, I, I, I thought when I was the general manager of Hino Motors, which is part of Toyota, I was shipping 100% on time delivery, 100%, never met to their request date, zero warranty, zero quality failures, zero inspection failures. Right. And when I went over to Hino for the first time, I thought they were going to roll off the red carpet because I was so unbelievably great supplier, right? From Bloomfield, Connecticut, we shipped to Hino City in Japan. Well, I got there and the diesel engine, which our product went on, they had 110 suppliers. And, and there's, a, there's a, a, uh, a list on the wall from the best supplier down to the last, all ranked in terms of you know, performance. So I looked up at the top, I expected to see my name up at the top three at least, right? And I didn't see my name. Then I realized, oh, wait a minute. They wrote all this in kanji characters. And, you know, that's why I don't recognize my name. Well, as my eyes glanced down the chart, I was number 106 out of 110. At least I beat four guys out. And I said, what the heck? You know, when I got in a meeting, they told me, Delucio son, when you ship your cartons to us, your labels, which we would put on by hand, all in the upper right-hand corner, are not always in exactly the same place. Sometimes they're half an inch down, a quarter of an inch down. They're in the general area, but they're not always the same. So like a dummy, I said, well, geez, you know, I didn't know that was a requirement, but, you know, it doesn't affect form, fit, or function. So what do you care? 
Those of your son, you don't understand. If you cannot guarantee the quality outside the box, how can you guarantee quality inside the box? So a real lesson for me, right? I thought I knew what the customer want. For them, great quality and on-time delivery were just entrees to doing business with them. A lot different than uh, the Caterpillars and Cummins uh, uh, of the world, right? I mean, their standards are much lower. Uh, when we did prototypes, we did 300 prototypes where a Cummins would ask for three, okay? I mean, unbelievable, different, different mindset altogether. Your employees, do you really know what their goals are and what they want? Everybody thinks it's more pay, okay? No, well, maybe you're right, but, but do you really know? And even your shareholders, what are they expecting from you? Not just returns, okay? They want an environmentally uh, you know, uh, a responsible company, for example, okay? So ask your, your stakeholders and then figure out the processes to make sure everybody wins, okay? Thinking you're different, everybody told me that. And after a while, when everybody says they're different, that means they're all the same, okay? Uh, I'm not arguing that you're not different. You do have to customize your business system to your business and to your culture. But the mindset that it, when somebody tells you they're different, the hidden word is, this doesn't apply to us, okay? And, 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 and that's not good, right? Um, if you're only looking for cost savings and only focusing on cost, you're going to lose, all right? And I'll talk more about that in the future in, in, in a little bit later. And Six Sigma. Six Sigma is a great tool. We used it in the Dan and her business system. We had to change the name because we had people, particularly coming in from GE, that wanted to make, replace the Dan and her business system with Six Sigma. And it was just one of a plethora of tools that we used. When you try to you know, improve everything with Six Sigma, and I've got a presentation on this up on YouTube when I compare Lean and Six Sigma and the theory of constraints, which we never use uh, for a lot of good reasons. You can't just say, we're gonna use a tool to improve everything, okay? It's like using a hammer to build a house and only a hammer, it doesn't work. And that was the mistake that GE made and I think Motorola made as well. So, so you gotta change your mindset around this, okay? As, as we look at this. Defaulting to the basics, okay? Uh, my, my, my mentor, Chihiro uh, Nakao, said, if you don't know standard work, which is one of the elements of the Toyota production system, you will not know, you do not know the Toyota production system, okay? And everybody thinks they know standard work, and it's a lot more difficult than you think it is, okay? Now, I'll go back. I should probably have a, a, a slide here for, you know, and this may not play internationally, but the famous fo NFL football coach, legendary coach, Vince Lombardi, his very first practice, he held up a football to all these future Hall of Famers, and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. He started with that basic and worked his way up of the basics of the game. And why did he do that? And that's how we won, I don't know, 10, 12 championships, the greatest coach in history, okay? And what did he do? He focused on the basics. I see so many people not focused on the basics with lean. Everybody says we're doing lean. I said, well, where's your standard work? Well, you know, it doesn't apply to us. Tech time doesn't apply to us. Really? Um, geez, you got some really nice yellow tape and nice poster boards. And boy, you got a really fancy Gemba board. But where's your standard work? How many people out there right now in their business have standard work in play? Real standard work. Okay. I'll bet you any money it's a very low percentage. Okay. Go default back to the basics. And here it is. This is the Toyota production system. Maybe a little fancier art, artistic graphic here, but we, you know, there's three things on the bottom, hygienical level scheduling, standard work, and Kaizen. And then you've got Jadoka and just in time. Now I'm gonna go through this in a lot more detail in the subsequent uh, 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 webinar with Dr. M. And I'll go in more detail in each and every one of these, okay? But how many, how many times have you gone into, uh, you know, what do you guys do? We do one Kaizen a month. Well, I'm not going to see you and tell you how many Kaizens to, you, you, you should do, but I can tell you right now, one's not enough. 
Okay. I, I can't tell you that. It's like saying, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger wants to become Mr. Universe and he goes to the gym once a month. It doesn't work. Okay. It just doesn't work. So default to the basics and understand the principles of lean just in time principle. We break that all the time. I see that, that philosophy of just in time, make, make what's needed, when it's needed, and the right quantity, the right quality that is needed. I see that principle being broken all the time. So default back to these basics, and I think you're gonna find that there's some pretty good, now you have to have a lot of discipline to do this, and this is, goes back to Dr. M's comment on, uh, on sustainability, but you've gotta have a lot of discipline. However, uh, default to the basics, and I think you're going to find that uh, uh, you're a lot better off if you're able to do that. Okay. Now we talk about SQDC, safety, quality, delivery, and cost. That's a principle, if you will. Everybody on this call that's, re that's listening to this, I'm sure all think safety is number one. But think about your business. Is it really? All right. And by the way, it's a hierarchy where safety comes first. So in other words, I am not going to hit a delivery, a quality, a delivery, or a cost objective if I have an unsafe operation. Day's over, we're not working in an unsafe business, okay? Well, assume I get, now some people say, you know, safety is an element of quality, which I can argue it is, uh, but we break it out, okay, for a, for a specific reason. Now, I am not going to ship to make a delivery commitment, which is D, a bad quality product, okay? I stop, I don't deliver, why? Because Q is higher than D. And if I have to air freight because I'm behind on the delivery, I'm gonna do it even though it's gonna damage C, which is cost. I'm gonna air freight, I'm gonna get that product to the customer because delivery is more important than cost. Okay, now, if you do all the right things with safety, quality, and delivery, cost almost takes care of itself. People say, well, you know, we're, we're trying to really drive productivity, I've read an article how Amazon's making their people work really hard. And I think it's a bad article because I don't think it's a fair representation of what Amazon's doing. But if, if, if you think about the reasons why, let's say your workforce isn't productive, it's not because they're bad people. It's not because they showed up and want to do a bad job today, okay? It's because your machine broke down. Your supplier didn't live, deliver parts. Uh, you had a quality issue, okay? whatever the case may be, all right? So, so if you focus on the process, and there's gonna be a whole nother uh, session with Dr. M and me on, on process, I have 10 rules for a process. If you focus on the process, a lot of this stuff takes care of itself, okay? And now relating back to real life, right? I got a little, uh, over on the right-hand side, I've got uh, uh, pit crew, okay? And one of the things I like to do is, is, is Compare our life to the way we run business. I'll bet you any money they're different. Okay, you won't go out and buy six months of groceries because they're on sale. Why do purchasing guys do that? Okay, why do they buy six months to save a nickel? Then the design changes and it all gets uh, written off as obsolete. Okay, but they got their bonus, right? That's one of the things in Lena County and I got rid of is. And I'll talk more about that in the lean economy module. Got rid of purchase price variance as a measure. Not good, okay? Because uh, you will buy, you'll compromise quality and all that. Uh, you don't, you don't, for example, uh, if you think about the, the concept of standard work and the notion that operators should always operate. They shouldn't go look for tools. They shouldn't go look for parts. They should be working in their work sequence as defined uh, by standard work. Well, that's the same thing as the driver being the operator on a racetrack, okay? We want to keep that driver on that racetrack as long as possible. Now, who does all the maintenance? Who does all the tire changes? It's the pit crew. Those are your water spiders, your material handlers, whatever you may call them, that keeps the operator running. They're bringing them parts so they don't have to leave their work sequence and leave their cell. So we laid back to real life. And just one another example, somebody said to me, you know, that we had a machine that we ended up taking 70, 75% of the changeover time down. And through our, our calculation, I argued that you could change, you could run all 12 parts on that machine every 1.2 days. And eventually a little bit more 
you know, improvement, you probably get done in one day. They said, well, why do we have to run all 12 parks in, in one day and do 12 changeovers? I said, well, that's the way your customers order. They couldn't get it. I said, well, let me ask you. I said, you know, go back to real life. How many people have had a barbecue in their backyard? And you made hot dogs and hamburgers. Well, you just make all the hot dogs first. Well, no. Why? Because some people, some of my guests might want hamburgers and some, you know, may want hot dogs. Well, wait a minute. Make all the hot dogs. That's what you're doing with your production. You're making part A or part number one all week, changing over on Saturday regardless of demand, then run like hell the next week on part two. Okay. So if you were ordering part eight, you had to wait eight weeks for them to run that part. Maybe you'll get it. Okay. I said, well, you don't want people standing around while the guys eating the hot dogs are sitting there. And then, you know, if you're, you're me, I want both. I want hot dogs and hamburgers. But, you know, you want mixed model. Said, Give me one of your production orders. And I looked at it. There were eight of the 12 parts that they ordered in one order. Well, why, why can't we make all these in one day? Why are we going to wait eight weeks to make these eight parts? Okay. You're make, making me wait for my hamburger. So they finally got it. Again, relate back to real life. And you'll find that if you take the practices, I'm sure most people on this call run a pretty lean life in terms of how they think about things and what they do. So think about it. You're not going to run your, your car around the block tonight a thousand times to get machine utilization out of it. But why is machine utilization a measure that people get paid on? There's no incentive not to change over. There's no incentive to do preventive maintenance. Why would I want to run my car around the block tonight? I said this to a CFO one time who had the utilization number in his uh, compensation plan for the plant. I said, well, you're going to run your car around the block tonight 100 times to get utilization out of it? Because he said, you know, we've got to get our money's worth uh, and all that. So again, relate back to real life. And I think you'll, you'll find that's a good guide for how you should do business. Okay, challenge the status quo. Okay, aligning with strategy, right? One of my favorite sayings from Ono is no problem is problem, right? Um, you know, uh, if you don't recognize you have a problem, then that's the biggest problem, right? Uh, sometimes my wife tells me this all the time, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but you know, align your transformation with strategy, and you know, there's going to be a whole session on the strategy deployment process with Dr. M. And uh, but I will say this: there's there's you've got to be able to decide what it is you're going to work on, and what processes need to be either greatly improved. Or, uh, or, 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 or invented because they don't exist to be able to hit your strategy, all right? And there's a lot more to this than that. But I will say, if you think about your business, your business probably consists of thousands of processes, anywhere from how you open up the mail in the mail room to how you process an invoice, take an order, develop a product, manufacture a product, whatever it may be, okay? Thousands of processes. And one of my first rules of a process is if it's not written down, you cannot call it a process, okay? And uh, that's rule number one of my 10 rules when you get to that presentation later later uh, this year. And those 10, <laughs> you don't go on to the other nine rules because you don't have a process. That's your, so when I say no problem is problem, that's your problem. You don't have a process because it's not even documented. And just because it's documented is another nine steps that you have to go through to make sure it works. And that's what that presentation is all about. But once we pick out the enabling processes that we're gonna need to hit our strategy, then that's what we wanna focus the majority of our Kaizen efforts towards, okay? And make the conscious decision what you're not gonna do, okay? Uh, it's, it's, you have to benchmark outside, okay? Benchmark uh, what really is good, but I think I think one of the things you want to think about here, you know, people would come up to me and say, hey, Mark, what, what's, at Danaher especially, what's world class for inventory turns? I don't know. What if I give you a number? All I know, you're not it, so get back to work, okay? And get better tomorrow than you were today. That's all I want you to do, all right? So sometimes you really got to look at a, an aggressive rate of improvement from where you are, as opposed to trying to hit some number that's out there that may or may not be meaningful to you. Okay, so if you really think about an aggressive rate of improvement, uh, that's really something I think that that has to be uh, uh, dealt with, you know, at minimum 50% improvement in quality. 
at minimum 50% improvement in on-time delivery in one year. And sometimes that's not even enough. And I, th I, think, I think you'll find that 50% number is a little bit of a shocker, but you'll blow it away most of the time if you do this right, if you do this right, and almost anything that you might try to do. Now, when you think about improvement and that rate of return, let's just, let's just go back to uh, quality. Okay, everybody knows that Six Sigma is 3.4 parts per million. Uh, now, you know, again, a mindset of why not zero? Why are we, my Japanese, Mr. Iwata said to me in Nakao, we don't understand Americans, 3.4 parts, Six Sigma. Why not zero? Why are we planning to fail 3.4 times out of a million? Why are we planning 99% on time delivery? Why not 100? What's so magical about 99? Okay. It's a mindset more than anything else, okay? So, so that mindset, if you will, okay, is uh, that mindset is, is important. And then all the engineers one time on LinkedIn were arguing with me, you can't have zero defects. And they gave me all the technical reasons why. Well, you know what? They're absolutely right. They can't have zero de defects. You wanna know why? Because of their mindset. That's why they're not gonna have zero defects and nothing to do with technology. So, so anyway, um, uh, it's a it's a mindset. That's the kind of thing you have to think about. Now, if you are at fifty thousand parts per million, okay, and you approve improve fifty percent per year, I think I did the math on this. Three, it will take you maybe thirteen or fourteen years at fifty percent a year to get to six sigma. That's way too long. So that would suggest that in the first year or two, you've got to improve a lot more than fifty percent. Okay to get that down, uh, maybe 80% in the first year. You know, you'll have to do the math, but don't accept mediocre improvements, okay? Stretch yourself. If, and when we talk about strategy deployment, a breakthrough, one of the characteristics of a breakthrough is you have no godly idea how to do it, okay? You have no idea how you're gonna do it, and that's okay. Everybody wants to plan strategy deployment knowing how they're gonna do something. And then that's just not, the essence of what we're talking about with breakthrough. Okay. And every breakthrough has to be cross-functional. Okay. I've never met one yet that is not. All right. So uh, what I mean by that, I can't just have a breakthrough in manufacturing without involving sales and the commercial group and design engineering. Okay. And finance. Okay, I can't do that. I have never saw a breakthrough yet in all my years of doing this that was just a singular function, okay? And when it comes to functions, and I said I talked about this earlier, I don't want the best function in the world. I don't want the best human resources department. I don't want the best IT department, the best engineering. I want the best enterprise. I would almost wish I could blow away functions if possible. Why do I say that? Because I can guarantee you, and this has been my experience, if you try to optimize any one function, you name it, HR, IT, engineering, manufacturing, accounting, finance, doesn't matter. If you try to optimize one function, you will sub-optimize the organization and the enterprise. I can guarantee you by trying to optimize a function, you will sub-optimize the enterprise. Okay, you need to work in a synergistic fashion across functions in order to build that one best enterprise. You cannot do it by being the best function. Okay, so how you work together, and that means everybody has to be on the same page from a philosophical perspective. The principles have to be thought out, non negotiables, which I'll talk about. You know, all these things have to, the, the leadership has to be of the same mindset. That's one of the problems I think I see that, you know, uh, well, that's an operating thing. That's manufacturing. You know, let's, you know, let that, let that go, you know. So anyway, uh, it doesn't really apply to me because I'm in, I'm in sales, right? Uh, I'm in design engineering. Now, what, what does Lean have to do? That's, that's for those guys that make widgets, right? So we've got to get to a point where we're thinking about working together to drive an enterprise. And by the way, this is where, I, I'm deviating a little bit here, but we talk about value stream management where you actually construct value stream organizations that have all the necessary uh, 
disciplines within that value stream, okay? Uh, so I don't have to buy for resources. I don't have to go to the head of engineering. Hey, I need Charlie to come over and work on a problem. Well, he's working for his leader and his leader got his goals. And guess what? Charlie doesn't care about my goals. I like to see a value stream organization where everything is uh, accountable and under the direction and control of the value stream leader so that we can attack problems immediately. Okay. And that's, that's really the real key here. Here's a break, a, a case study. When we said we wanted to go to Asia to become counter-cyclical, okay, because we were, we were tied into the North American truck market and it was very, you know, when GDP went up, our business went up. When it went down, it went down, right? But if we went international, we could maybe deaden the impact of a, a U.S. you know recession, let's say, as long as there wasn't a world recession. So we looked at Europe and we looked at Asia, and you know we said, well, we're going to pick Asia, in particular Japan, because of the big OEMs over there: Hino, Mitsubishi, uh, a couple others. But those are the two big ones that I work with. And uh, you know, of course, being part of, uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, Toyota, uh, big truck manufacturer and engine uh, builder, right? So when we started benchmarking, we said, well, geez, you know what? We're not gonna play in Japan. You wanna know why? They developed a new engine in 18 months that our product went on. We were taking 72 months to develop the, the Jake brake. That's not going to work. So it became a strategic deployment initiative for us to reduce our new product development process to 18 months. Okay. And we did a lot of things to do that. But one of the things that we looked at is we looked at a particular part of the value stream for new product development and found that the engine lab, the dynamometer, where we actually tested our engine brakes on, uh, the engine would take three weeks to change over. And you know, it was a big art project over there. You know, no sense of urgency. There was no production mentality over there. It was like a, a big laboratory. And then once the brake was on the engine, it had to run for 500 hours. So, so we had maybe 15 or 20 different, you know, uh, engines that we were trying to, uh, Jake brakes that we were trying to, to test. And it elongated the, the NPD cycle. Now, you know, you can argue, well, I can expedite one of those and put it up in front of the line, but that means everybody else is going to be held up. We need to be able to do this uh, a lot quicker than three weeks. So we actually used a tool called single minute exchange of die and got it down to one day. All right, SMED, SMED, single minute exchange of die. We got the change over time down to one day, which I, I argue still could have been better. But anyway, we took it from three weeks to one day. And, and that allowed us amongst a, a bunch of other things to drive to an 18 month new product development cycle. Now, when we when we got to 18 months, believe it or not, he was at 16, okay? They don't stop, okay? And that's something that you have to realize as well when you benchmark. So this is a really key one, how we took a tool, because everybody wants to start with tools and that's the wrong answer, okay? You have to start with the architecture of the business, which is your strategic plan, and look at your general contractor, which is your strategy deployment, and then look at your, your skilled tradesmen, your electricians to build a house, your plumbers, right? That's the Kaizen that we have to, in this case, we picked SMED as the tool to help us improve this, uh, this uh, engine lab uh, lead time, okay, or change over time. So notice how the tool matched the strategy. That's a real key. And I'll talk more about this uh, in the strategy appointment session that we do in uh, the next, you know, over the next couple of months. Okay, so rough numbers, I don't know, 70% is the right number, but a good part of your Kaizen activity should drive towards your strategic breakthrough objectives, okay? And you gotta determine what that real number is. I talked about making this uh, uh, an enterprise endeavor. You know, one of the hardest jobs I think I've ever had was you know, running the DBS office because I had authority, but I had no accountability. You know, I, I, I had an influence people, I, I couldn't just say, go do this, right? So lead the organization if, as if you have no power. And for those of you out there that have uh, those kind of roles, I have a white paper up on LinkedIn. And if you email me uh, at, you know, at the end of this presentation, I will be happy to send you the white paper. 
It's called the Chief Transformation Officer, my thoughts on that role and how I think companies have to look at that role, okay? But lead organizations have no power. You have to influence people and get them involved in the change process, okay? And a lot of us focus on MUDA, which is a traditional seven owner waste, you know, transportation defects, all that. But Mura and Muri, Mura is on evenness and Muri is call it unreasonableness, okay? When I, those are normally driven by policy. So a policy that says, we are going to uh, make our sales bonus this month. So that means that the sales force goes out and all the orders come in at the end of the month, end of the quarter, uh, so they get their sales bonus. And they discount it to entice customers to take the product early, which by the way, is a violation of just-in-time philosophy. Okay, so here again, going back to the, the principles. But the policy is such that the sales guys are gonna win. The, the sales vice president is going to get his bonus and the function's gonna win in this case. But now the plant's gotta work all kinds of overtime. We have to jerk around with our supply chain now and our suppliers. Everybody else lost, the enterprise lost, but the sales department won. That's a policy, okay? And there's a lot of examples like this, right? One of the policies could be, you know, well, we, we have, you have, to, you have to take your vacation by the end of the year. So everybody, all of a sudden, you know, October, November, taking vacations and we have nobody to, to make the product because we didn't manage it effectively. So these policies drive a lot of this waste, okay? And sometimes those are bigger waste than, than just pure muda, right? So uh, think about that. And I talked about enterprise Kaizen. When we think about breakthrough, we're doing enterprise-wide Kaizen, not point Kaizen. Okay, now point Kaizen would be, I'm going into a specific function, let's say a cell, uh, an accounts payable department, whatever, and I'm making point improvements. And normally what's happened with the companies that have called me, hey, Mark, we're flatlined, is they've only been participating in point Kaizen, but they never figured out how to, change the enterprise. And a large reason that had to do with mindset because all the leaders went on the same page, okay? They were all over the place in terms of their thinking on this, uh, including the CEO, okay? And then I also talked about lean accounting. Again, there'll be a whole session on that in the future to talk about the dysfunctional, uh, I had to unlearn everything I learned in college. And, you know, uh, I'm a certified management accountant and all the cost accounting I learned, I, I work for some of the greatest cost accounting people in the world. I don't do it all. All those variance analysis, absorption. I'll talk more about this in the lean accounting presentation, but you know, I, I learned that because it was driving the wrong behaviors. Counter, all I did when I developed lean accounting, I said, well, look, you know, besides value stream costing and driving cost to the value stream from an overhead perspective and not allocating overhead based on some arbitrary allocation method, Okay, we got really accurate product costs, but then I said, well, the management reporting of what we're doing is just driving the wrong behaviors. Okay, so I'll talk more about that when we get to the lead accounting part. Okay, and then of course the culture, and this all has to do with uh, respect for people. The fish rots from the head. Okay, uh, if it's not working, look at yourself as a leader. Okay, you're probably the biggest root cause on the Pareto as to why it's not working, all right? Uh, everybody likes to take a victimhood mentality, how they're different and how they have no uh, you know, control over outside circumstances and all that. Well, not really good enough. The customer doesn't care about that either, right? So look at yourself as you go through this and develop you know, what I call non-negotiables, okay? Uh, leaders gotta get involved. In the only way leaders gonna learn about lean from the CEO on down is do it. You cannot learn how to play golf by watching Tiger Wood videos or reading a book. I got the best book in the world on, on golf. At least they say it is. It's Ben Hogan's Five Lessons. I've read that book 20 times, but if I don't get out on the course and put the club in my hand and do it, I'm never going to learn. Lean is exactly the same way. So it's disrespectful for a leader to come in and say, I'm going to observe you guys do Kaizen. I'm too busy to do Kaizen. I can't get involved myself. 
but I'm so smart. I can, I can, you know, that's a message anyway that they're sending. I'm just going to observe you and I'll learn through osmosis. No, no, I would not let any executive observe. I, I've kicked CEOs out of the room and said, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to go home. Okay. I'm, you're not allowed here. You're going to be a disruptive, disruptive force if you're not part of the team. When you go in and out, because you're more important than everybody and you've got all these meetings and phone calls, well, guess what? No, we got to bring you up to speed every time you walk in. No, we're not doing that. Either you're on the team, you leave your title at the door and you participate 100% of the time, or please just go away. Okay. So you, you've got to get involved to learn this. All right. It's one of the things, you know, I don't know maybe Dr. M will do something on leader standard work someday and talk about the things that a leader has to do to actively engage in it. This is not a spectator sport, okay? Non-negotiables. What are the things that you're not gonna argue about over and over and over again? Even getting down to details, like we were not gonna argue amongst our 150 facilities around the world about chairs in a cell. We had our view on chairs in a cell and we're not gonna allow them. And I'll be happy to sit there and tell you the reasons why, but it's not a debate, okay? That was, that was agreed to, and we said, no chairs in a cell. It's a non-negotiable. Another non-negotiable is processes need to be documented. Blameless environment, right? All that type of stuff. We had a, a list of non-negotiables that someday I could talk about, but you know, uh, that's, that's a real, real key, right? One of the other ones I think that I learned from my friend John Shook at Toyota, he told me that Toyota does not allow anybody to opine on a problem if they haven't seen it firsthand. So that's where go see, ask why, show respect them. And Fujio uh, Cho, the former chairman of uh, Toyota had go see, ask why, show respect. It's probably the most powerful lesson a leader, a uh, question a leader can ask is one word, why? Okay. And a lot of leaders have to transition from being the answer person, answer man, let's say, to the person that asks the right questions. Because the further you're away from the problem, the, the lower the quality of the suggestion, if you will, to fix the problem, okay? So the C-suite is not in any position to solve the problems that are going on, on the floor. Man, they're the worst ones I bring in, okay? The best people to do that, people doing the work. Now, if I don't have a process to do that, I haven't trained them on problem solving, haven't given them the time, right? Guess what? It's not going to work, okay? You got to put some real processes in place and give people a chance to succeed. You can't just wish it because it's on a poster board that says, we solve problems at the lowest possible level. Really? Do you really? What's your process for that? Well, we don't have a process. We just, we just try to do that. Well, how, how do you do it? It's not going to work, okay? Unless you actually have a de deliberate process as to how to do that, okay? So I came up with a slogan for a slogan. Uh, you know, values and principles without an underlying process are just slogans. Don't tell me that you believe in the leader's role, number one role is to develop your people. Don't tell me that. If you don't have a creative element process, okay? Don't tell me again, solving problems at the lowest level in the organization is what you are pushing for, but you have no process to do that. You have no training. Some companies don't even have a problem solving process. Never mind, you know, giving people the time. Okay. So these are some of the ones I kind of like, but I think, you know, as a company, you have to kind of come up with, you know, some are pretty generic, but they're, they're, they're powerful, right? Do you really have a way to measure respect for people? Okay. 50% of the performance reviews I gave to my people at Danaher were based on values, which were things like, you know, communication, teamwork, honesty, that type of thing, right? And the other 50% were more, you know, technical nature of what they were supposed to do as a, uh, in, their, in their role, okay? Uh, so you could be a really great engineer and put together some unbelievable designs, but not make it on the value side of the equation, you're not gonna do well, okay? So that, that's how it works, right? So, so think about this. Uh, one other example, how many people out there today measure on-time delivery to the promise date to their customer, not to their original request date? Why? Because it's going to look bad and they're going to be shamed with a 20% on-time delivery number to request date. 
Okay. Well, there, the underlying root cause problem of that is you don't have a blameless environment and you're not really welcoming problems to get better. Okay. So that's the issue there. So if you don't, if you really do think customer is a real key and you got to serve as a customer, you will measure to the request date because that's what's meaningful to the customer. If the customer wants it on the 15th and you promise it to them on the 30th and you get it to them on the 30th and you mark yourself green, guess what? He's marking your red. Okay. And somebody else is going to come along and figure out how to do it on the 15th. And then all of a sudden you won't hear from that customer anymore. So if you really want to just make yourself look good, God bless you. Okay. But it's not going to work if you don't put your, yourself in the seat of the customer and see through his eyes or through your employee's eyes when you're trying to look at the objectives of the employee. Okay. And, and, and you really got to do a better job at thinking, you know, you know, most people have to do a better job at thinking about what really is the goal. I don't want to become enamored with lean because that's one of the mistakes we made at DBS. We became enamored with DBS. The objective was to do DBS. Wrong. We should become enamored with the objectives of our key stakeholders. That's what we should become enamored with. And now we think about, okay, well, how do we use lean to achieve the objectives of our, of our key stake, stakeholders? Okay. So don't get caught up on, you know, becoming enamored with the tools or with lean itself, you know, I mean, be really good at the tools and, but use them the right way and use them when, when necessary in the right order, in the right priority. And also, and again, I maybe didn't say this earlier with strategy deployment, You've got to make a conscious decision what you're not going to do as an organization. Really key. Otherwise, all everybody's pet projects are going to come into play and you'll be diffused and your resources will be diffused and, and you won't get to where you need to go. Okay. So you're perfectly engineered to get the results you've already gotten. Right now, from the, the pen and paper that's in your desk, the lines you drew in the parking in the parking lot for your, your parking your, for your car to the curtains on the window, everything that you've done as an organization got you whatever results you got today. Perfect, you are perfectly engineered. Now, don't like the results? You gotta change the process. Okay, and that's what this is all about. All right, so uh, here's my contact details. If anybody wants to reach out to me. Uh, and uh, I think, Dr. M, I think that is, uh, the end of uh, my presentation. Excellent, um, excellent. Uh, okay. I would like to be the host now. Okay. Is okay. that something I have to do? I'm gonna make you the host. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent, Mark. And thanks a lot. And. Uh, what I'm going to do is this, that uh, this which we have recorded is the first episode and we have got five more episodes to come with you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Followed by this would be the 10 prints, the uh, TPS overview, Toyota Production System overview, followed mm -hmm. by 10 rules of process, followed by strategy deployment and lean accounting. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to see each other very often. Uh, and this is my excellent first guest for supporting and sustaining continuous improvement processes. Thank you very much. And with respect to this, uh, I will be hosting it on my LinkedIn. Mark would also do that on his LinkedIn. Also, it will be available on YouTube. The notification for that, you just wait. We will be doing it in a couple of days. Thank you very much, Mark, and take care. Have a, have a great evening in uh, India, and uh, we'll see you on the, next, uh, on the next broadcast. Yes. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye now.